So one of the things that Dr. Friedberg brought up is, is the issue of giving other interoperative therapies. And one of the ones that's been uh, talked about for a long time is something called a HIOC, or a heated interoperative chemotherapy. Uh, and a, a number of, uh, a couple of years ago, or actually more than a couple of years, three, three or four years ago, we contemplated uh, adding interoperative chemotherapy with or without heat to our, our uh, protocol wanted to evaluate it a little bit more about what would be the ideal uh, conditions because people have reported in the literature a lot of different conditions with hyperthermia, different temperatures, different lengths of time, uh, and so there was really no standard to, to actually add and even different chemotherapy agents. So we wanted to go to the lab and, and try to figure out what it was that we were going to add before we were going to start adding it. So we started looking at hyperthermia. Uh, and, I'm, and so today I'm going to talk about not only hyperthermia, but just thermal therapy altogether, because I think we found some interesting uh, results. I have no conflicts uh, or disclosures. Um, if you look at an overview, thermal therapy, at least the way I'm talking about it, is, is temperature, using temperature differences to treat cancer. Uh, and you can either obviously use low temperatures or less than 37 degrees, which is normal thermia, uh, or high temperatures, uh, more than 37 degrees, which is hyperthermia. Um, hyperthermia, as a general treatment, has, has been uh, done for a long time. Uh, it's been associated with some enzyme abnormalities, enzyme functional differences, hypermetabolism. And ultimately, at high temperatures, you get protein de denaturation, coagulative necrosis, and something equivalent to a burn uh, that you see clinically. Uh, and we use we, that kind of uh, can't, um, heat to actually use it clinically in surgery, to do electrocautery for surgery, to actually use it for our benefit. Uh, so there are some benefits to using it uh, clinically, but in terms of cancer therapy, the benefits have been less well defined. Hypothermia, on the other hand, uh, you, when you, treat, you make cells cold, classically you're, you're making them hypo, using hypometabolism. We use that clinically also in uh, cardiothoracic surgery to, to lower the metabolism during cardiopulmonary bypass surgery to, for transplantation, for preservation. So at lower temperatures, uh, hypometabolism metabolism is beneficial, but ultimately, if you get to real low temperatures, you get ice crystal formation, mem membrane disruption, and it's something equivalent to a frostbite. So clinically, uh, cryopreservation of cells is useful. So again, hypothermia is useful clinically in other ways. Uh, both of these things are essentially um, non-selective. They cause cell damage no matter what kind of cells are there, uh, at least as far as we know. And But they could be used in a potentially additive or synergistic way with other modalities during surgery. Oops, wrong one. So I'm going to look at hyperthermia first. The background is that hyperthermia has been tried for a long time for cancer therapy. Um, I actually first started doing hyperthermia research in about 1978 or 9. I can't even remember. It's been so long. Um, and we did a lot of uh, basic science kind of evaluations of what hyperthermia did, what kind of temperatures you required, what, what they did to cells when you heated them. And, uh, and actually defined a temperature which was 43 degrees below which people, the cells actually developed thermal tolerances simultaneous to heating. So in the, in the things that we learned way back then, we, the idea was that you should heat cells to higher than 43 degrees in order to get the best benefit. Um, there's different ways to heat cells. You can heat them with <coughs> systemically in a person, for instance, by heating their blood and, and perfusing their entire body. You can use fluid, like in the in the uh, peritoneal cavity or in the pleural cavity, to, to heat the local area. And also, there, for a while, people were investigating magnetic coils, which they put around somebody's body and heat the liver, for instance, for met metastatic disease from colorectal cancer. Um, but that has not been used uh, recently. So in the past, there has been benefits looking looking at regional therapy, particularly limb, limb uh, therapy for melanoma. People have used it and also perfusion of the liver for uh, metastatic disease, so there have been clinical uses that have been derived. Um, but uh, <coughs> um, these, the, these kind of studies that have been done have basically show 
that um, in the past the tissues uh, at very high temperatures are basically destroyed. Uh, some of the data suggests that chemotherapy levels, when you get, make uh, cells or tissue hy hyperthermic, the chemotherapy levels that get into the tissues is higher. The actual efficacy in terms of the cytotoxicity of those higher levels has not been well documented. Um, and I, what I want to point out is that basically the temperatures that a lot of these things are done at is somewhere between 39, uh, which is a little bit of a fever in normal people, to 43 degrees. And and very few people use temperatures above 43 degrees, which is, as I mentioned, the one temperature you know, where uh, below which you uh, develop thermal tolerance simultaneously to heating. Um, so in terms of HIOC, uh, we want to know is does hyperthermia work with chemotherapy? Uh, what was the optimal temperature that if you're going to use it? What was the op optimal time of exposure? These were all questions that you wanted to define before we started using it clinically and what were the optimal drug, drug or drugs. So uh, one of the things to keep in mind when you review these things is this is a 1964 paper and it's hard to find but, but uh, there's a Skipper Shabel Wilcox uh, log kill model that was done when they were looking looking at uh, the kinetic mechanisms of chemotherapy and they were looking at a leukemia model and you to keep in mind is that if you um, kill cells, if you kill 50 per, or, or I say one log of the cells, 50% of the cells, those cells if they grow within 21 day doubling time then they, they grow back within 21 days and it's hard for uh, a uh, relatively modest reduction in the tumor cell number to, to translate into clinical practice. So the, the log kill model is that in order to see something clinically relevant, you need to see several log kills. So when you go through this data, you have to keep that in mind as well. So this is some basic data. This is looking at a, a um, clonogenic assay that we do. We run cells that are, are grown in petri dishes and they're exposed to a temperature, uh, either hyperthermia or hypothermia, in the petri dish and then they're plated onto uh, di additional dishes uh, and then they're, they're count the clones that come out of that, the number of cells that can actually form a colony are then counted. So uh, this is a graph showing some of the basic data that we, that we did just to start off with with, which is, this is a 100% or one uh, log, and this is 10% one log kill and two log kills. And the blue here is a, is a cell line called the Chinese hamster ovary cells, and those are classic sensitive to hyperthermia. So those are the ones that are positive controls. And you can see here is a group of 42 degrees and 45 degrees that we expose them to. And this is 45 degrees over 20, 40, and 60 minutes. And this is 42 degrees over 20, 40, and 60 minutes in the same cell line. So you can see that as the temperature goes up, the survival goes down, and as the time goes up, the survival goes down. So that's, that's our positive control. And then we had just some other cell lines we exposed initially, which was an A5469 uh, tumor, tumor line, which is a lung cancer. And this is 42 degrees again. There was very little effect at 42 degrees, and then at 45 degrees there was an effect. And then we did one other one, which is a mesocell line, NCI H28, which had basically n almost no effect either way. Um, so as I mentioned, in clinically, uh, almost everybody is using around 42 degrees, maybe 43 degrees. So when you look at this, this is the what the clinical temperatures that are being used, at least in the perfusion models in, in, the, cl in the clinical practice, and 45 is, is way beyond what people have been using. So then we just started looking at 42 degrees or as an example to see if we could um, play around with the conditions to see if we can get some benefit. And so this is a bunch of different cell lines and all exposed to 42 degrees for 20, 40, or 60 minutes. You can see this is, a, again, the Cho cells, the Chinese hamster ovary cells, which did show an effect. Uh, and there's MC, MCRC5, uh, our lung fibroblast line, that also showed uh, an effect from the heat. This is just heat alone, but you can see here all the other cell lines, the A549, as well as three mesocell lines show basically no effect from hyperthermia. Uh, and this is again an isolation in a petri dish, so there's, there are some differences between this and in vivo. Um, so then we looked at adding cisplatin alone, which is something that people have been talking about a lot. So we added cisplatin to this, this whole uh, mix, and here is a dose of cisplatin going from zero up to four micrograms per ml. 
which is equivalent to the uh, serum level in a, in a high dose, the cisplatin, the dose in a, in a human. And basically we showed that with the increasing dose of the cisplatin, the, the survival goes down. Uh, and going across here is, uh, is hyperthermia at 42 degrees for again 20, 0, 20, 40, and 60 minutes. And you can see for the most part the hyperthermia doesn't really change anything. So the cisplatin does work, but the hyperthermia doesn't really do much. So then we started adding other things, the cisplatin and pemetrexed, uh, which is a, obviously the standard that people have talked about for, chemo th for uh, mesothelioma, and we looked at the same kind of thing. Uh, and this is actually a no chemotherapy control. This is cisplatin alone, and then this is the combination with higher doses of pemetrexed. And you can see again that the chemotherapy does work. It drops the, the survival down to relatively low levels. Um, this is actually 100% versus 0%. Versus, uh, so you can see that this is still only dropping down the cells to maybe 80% of, of the control groups. And, and again, in a log kill model, that's not exactly very impressive. But there is, there is a little bit of effect uh, of the heat. You can see particularly when you get to the highest doses of uh, chemotherapy. So there is maybe uh, a slight effect. Um, this is, sorry, I forgot to mention. It's not working. Uh, there it goes. Okay, so this is another mesocell line, which is basically showed pretty much the same thing. At the highest doses, there's a reasonable effect, but a lot of the hyperthermia effect is not is really not there. Um, so we looked at all these, and we published this just recently in February in the JTCVS, and we basically concluded that hyperthermia alone has very little effect on mesothelial growth, at least in vitro in that mesothelioma doesn't appear to be a particularly heat sensitive tumor, which was originally reported back in 1988 uh, from the lab that actually I worked in. There was some very minimal data that suggested that mesothelioma was more sensitive to other tumors like melanoma, but it's really not a heat sensitive tumor. And chemotherapy does produce additive effects with hyperthermia, but the multivolt agents and really high temperatures like 45 degrees are really needed before you get clinically, probably clinically relevant uh, levels. Um, so as part of this thing, we also were, for a variety of reasons, interested in hypothermia. So uh, we, were to, we were wondering whether hypothermia would work, whether there, what the optimal temperature, again, if we're going to expose uh, tumor cells to low temperatures, and the same kind of questions. So when we went down, this is showing the same Chinese hamster ovary cells. Uh, and there, this is uh, 4 degrees, these are 10, 10 degrees, and this is 20 degrees. So we l lowered down the temperature slightly. Uh, and you can see that for 20, 40, and 60, 20, 40, and 60, 24, and 60, that increasing uh, times at lower temperatures did lower, lower the viability slightly, but it's still at probably clinically irrelevant levels. Um, and uh, here you can see that uh, we kind of compared to what the data was from the hyperthermia. And this is the 45 degrees. So this is really all the levels of change are the same except for at 45 degrees, which is the only one that produces significant levels of change. And this is the A549 cells, the lung cancer cells, same thing. Basically, no effect from lowering the temperatures a little bit. But again, with the hyperthermia at 45, uh, that's what it looked like you needed. Here's the meso, MSTO 211A. H, which again only at 45 degrees dropped down at all. So looking at all these, it really didn't seem like there was going to be much effect from any of the, any of the thermal therapy at all. Uh, but then we took it one step further and we actually exposed the cells to freezing temperatures, so below zero. Uh, and when we did that, we dropped the cell survival dropped down dramatically. So when you looked at this, this was uh, uh, minus 80 degrees. So we basically put the cells into a, a freezer uh, and exposed them for brief periods of time. This is really um, for one uh, 
these are one, three, and five minutes. So you, if you look at this, the, and one is one exposure, two exposures, and three exposures. So we did three cycles, because that's what people are doing clinically with um, cryoablation. So we looked at one, uh, one cycle, two cycles, and three cycles. And you see that basically the more cycles, the lower the survival was. But with the uh, survival is, is very low, even as, as, as brief as five minutes of uh, exposure to freezing temperatures. And A549, again, this is the this, um, regular cryo uh, treatments, but this is when you start to freeze, it drops way down very, very dramatically. And even the, even the meso lines drops down to very low, you know, here's a dose effect from the time, but the number of cycles, sorry, and then the time goes across here. Five, five minutes at, at uh, very low temperatures, you get very low survival. And uh, it doesn't matter the cell line, each cell line looks pretty much the same. So what we try to do with, it, with the hypothermia that basically um, we try to put that together with the hyperthermia and, and basically make a characterized thermal response uh, curve for each tumor type to see if we can characterize the tumors as being different. So what we did is we then looked at uh, the whole the whole spectrum of responses from 45 degrees to below zero, and this is for the Chinese hamster ovary cells. So you can see they do respond to hyperthermia treatments by lowering uh, by a, over a log log and a half, and at freezing temperatures they lower down again down to very low low survival. And that's our control. And A549, the lung cancer cells, not so much hyperthermia, but they do respond to hypothermia. And the mesothelioma cells, again, very little response to hyperthermia, but dramatic responses to hypothermia. So if you just freeze these cells um, for a brief period of time, you can get better, better log kills than any other thermal type of uh, manipulation. And it was, it was consistent across all the cell lines. So clinically, how can you use this? Well, this is what, something that we've talked about before at the IMIG meeting um, last fall. Uh, we've used this clinically to, to actually treat localized recurrences. So here is a little recurrence after a pleurectomy of a chest wall, in the chest wall of a localized area of tumor that was painful. Uh, you can see it on the PET scan. Uh, and then here is a needle. You can't really see the needle, but the needle is inserted in here and then you, we freeze it. And again, because of the data and everything, we're freezing it in three cycles for uh, three to five minutes. And then, and then uh, you can see on this, on, actually on the CT scan, you see the whole tumor area gets dark because uh, it, it's really, it's really uh, when it freezes, it gets less dense. And so you can see that very dramatically and you can see exactly what you're freezing. And then afterwards, when you repeat the PET scan again, three months later, you see basically a black hole here. There's no, no longer any activity. It's just all completely ablated. So it, it's, it's something that looks like, um, in our, our experience, that hyperthermia is, has not really panned out to be very successful, but clinically, the hypothermia data that we uh, have generated seems to hold true uh, clinically. And here, this is a, just like Dr. Friedberg show, this is the diaphragm after we, we've taken it off, and here's the uh, pericardium again. And so what we're working on now is a way to actually apply hyperthermia to the surface afterwards, so to, to basically flash freeze this entire surface to get any residual cells to minimize the, the possibility of recurrence is even after surgery. So in summary, mesothelma is, in the past has been thought to be actually a hyper uh, sensitive tumor to hyperthermia with or without chemotherapy, but with the log kill requirements, that doesn't seem to be uh, the case, at least based on our studies. Uh, it does seem to be sensitive to cryoablation at temperatures less than zero degrees, um, and that may be provide a, a method of intraoperative adjuvant therapy for increasing the um, effect, efficacy of surgery and with an acceptable toxicity. Again, we have this usual person, Dr. Dong Mai Hao is the one who really did all these studies, so she, she deserves the credit for getting all these curves and doing all the hard work. So with that, I think we may have caught up a little bit. Uh, so I want to then open the floor to any questions uh, of any of the panelists. If we can use, there's a, a microphone, so if you can use the microphone if you